Okay, so today we're going to just do a very brief overview of who our EAL students are and uh, some of their different backgrounds and the different needs that they face. And then the bulk of the presentation will be about how we can support these EAL students in our classes and our schools um, with linguistically appropriate practices. So the students that are in our classrooms that are learning English are here uh, for different reasons. Some of them have immigrated to Canada to seek a better life. They might want you know, more opportunities for education and careers for their children. Some of them arrive as refugees, and while they're very, very grateful to be here, uh, they don't necessarily have the choice of where they land. So we have those students. And then we have other temporary residents that are here on work or study permits. So whether that be at university, community college, or a language school. Uh, and then a smaller number of our language learners are actually Canadian born children who do speak a different language other than English at home. Typically, these students would end up receiving EAL within grade primary and one. Um, that's usually when it comes to our attention. So there's a few of them. And then there is another smaller population of language learners who are here uh, with an international program. It's fee paying. And so that might be here on an exchange program or here to get a Canadian diploma, high school diploma. Um, so, but in the end, regardless of why they are here, uh, they are all here to learn English and they need support from classroom teachers and EAL teachers. So, our language learners come to us with various backgrounds, um, different experiences, and some have experience with education and some don't. And they also have different levels of literacy, which we'll talk about on the next slide. So, some students have, have attended school in their home countries, just like our students here. Um, and so they will have a great deal of prior, con prior knowledge um, and just academic experiences. They, you know, have done science in their home language, math in their home language. They've studied history in their home language. But they may not necessarily have covered Canadian curriculum and some of our, you know, culturally specific content. Uh, some of our students are literate in their home language, and this makes learning English much easier. But then we have another group of students who have experienced um, either no formal education or it's been quite interrupted. So whether that be typically it's due to war, um, not so much here, but in other parts, like in the States, they might be. Um, students of or children of migrant workers or you may also if you do have experience with EAL students you might notice that they take off back home for extended periods of time so we could have a student maybe born in Canada and they go back home to Dubai let's say for three out of the ten school months um, and some students, this is an even smaller subpopulation of English language learners, and these are students that don't have any literacy skills in their first language. And oftentimes uh, they come from a very oral language and it's just spoken word. And so, you know, these are a very challenging group with very specific needs, but, you know, they haven't you know, they're not familiar with the written word. Maybe, you know, we've had one group that recently came from Somalia and the only thing that they could read was the Quran. So it's very, very important that we know our students and we know the background of our students and uh, the specific needs um, that they have and sort of what education and experiences they are, they are bringing into the classroom with them. Uh, 
And I do just want to reiterate the fact that while some of these students don't have previous education, they still have um, very rich life experiences. And it's up to us to sort of uh, provide opportunities for those experiences and interests to shine through. All right, so we've got uh, conversational English and academic English. In conversational English, it really only takes one to two years to acquire. You know, this is functional. You can carry on a general conversation. You understand what your friends are talking about. Uh, and academic English is, you know, the content, the curriculum, and it's five to seven years at least. And that's the challenging part of it. Sometimes uh, teachers can be a bit fooled by the ability of students because they come and they may sound like native English speakers. Uh, and then it takes a little bit of time to reveal that that's sort of where the vocabulary and the language, the oral language ability, um, how do I want to word this? It's sort of, uh, it can trip you up a bit because you think that maybe they have more English than they actually do. And when it gets down to reading and reading comprehension and, you know, inferring and writing abilities, uh, then we see that they actually do require a lot more support. So, um, but then, you know, we also, some teachers can maybe sometimes incorrectly profile a student because, you know, maybe they arrive and they have a, a different last name. And some teachers have kind of automatically assumed that they must need an EAL assessment. Um, there are certain things that that child doesn't understand. But just because they don't understand certain words, it doesn't mean that they're not proficient in English just because they have a different last name. So um, before we jump too quickly into requesting EAL assessments, um, sort of give them some time and, and really kind of collect some evidence that would support why you think that they would warrant an EAL assessment. Typically, this is for, for uh, students in grade primary, we see this happen or students who have moved into a school from out of, um, out of, out of the regional center or out of province where we don't have a lot of um, background information. All right, so what exactly does it mean to be linguistically appropriate? And what are these practices? So it simply means to just include and value their home language and experiences as a part of who they are and what they bring to the classroom. Um, and we should really be looking to their home language as a benefit sometimes. And it's not so much anymore, but you know, we used to hear, well, no, they're here, they're here to learn English, they're here to speak English. And yeah, to a certain extent that's true. However, could you imagine being plopped down in Korea and being told, no, you cannot use your English? Um, we would probably all uh, really struggle and be quite um, anxious about going to school and, and very stressed out. So very important to, to value uh, their first language. Um, you know, it's important to make connections between their cultural backgrounds and to bridge what they already have to new concepts, vocabulary, knowledge, and skills. And it's also critical that our language learners be doing the same as our, as their English counterparts, so as their peers, um, but just sort of at a level that is appropriate. And so we call this parallel teaching. And I will say, um, again, going back to previous years, not so much anymore, uh, you know, it, it wasn't uncommon to see EAL students at the back of the room doing something completely different because you can't see me, but quotation or air quotation, they wouldn't understand it anyway. And so um, that's really a deficit model thinking. And so it's about exposure and opportunity. So, 
All right. So again, valuing their home and home language and their culture. So tapping into their background and experiences and what they bring with them. And it's crucial to remember that they are becoming bilingual or multilingual. So a lot of times we're quick to say, oh, they can't speak English. They can't, they can't. However, in a, in a year or so and onwards, they're going to be, you know, very fortunate to be bilingual and multilingual. And that's something that I am, you know, personally quite envious of. So uh, another thing is to incorporate their as aspects of their culture in your teaching. So this means, you know, digging deeper than just doing holiday worksheets um, or, you know, if it's Nehru's for, you know, the Persian or Iran New Year. Um, you don't just give them a coloring worksheet. It's, you know, just incorporating aspects of their culture within your teaching. So, you know, various things like read alouds and storybooks to reflect different cultures, having visitors in. I know a number of EAL uh, teachers, sorry, have invited family members in to teach a craft or read a story, teach about a holiday. Um, I know that public libraries, and I don't know what regional, uh, what regions you guys are with, but I do know that within um, Halifax Public Library, there's a growing collection of dual language books or books that are just in different languages. Um, and so, you know, upon first arrival, when we do have new new students to English, um, encouraging them to use their first language to support or sorry yeah use their first language to support their english so here are a few strategies so of course number one for all students is to create a safe and welcoming class so the number one thing that we recommend is to pronounce their name correctly uh it's awful when you hear, you know, and I know we don't get it the first or even the second or third try, but don't ever say, you know, if a student's name is Mohammed and they say, no, it's Mohammed and you just can't get it articulated quite right. Don't just say, oh, no, well, I'm just going to call you Mo. I can't say that. That is um, highly inappropriate. Some of the younger students, um, they don't understand the concept of an accent. And so while we we try our best to say it correctly, it may not actually sound exactly like how their friends or their family from back home would say it. Um, but we're not creating a nickname and we're not shortening it. And and that's the important part. Um, you know, find a. a a student, another student in your class that shows, you know, um, an outgoing personality and some leadership um, personality characteristics, or someone who preferably does speak the same language and have them ba that be their kind of go-to person to, you know, make sure that they've got the right scribbler out or it's time to line up or sometimes simple things like looking for clues as to what the other students are doing. Uh, not all students will pick up on that. Most do, but there are some that don't. And so it's nice to have the, a little buddy that will say, you know, this is where we're going or can point to a picture. Sometimes we'll teach that student how to use Google Translate. And, uh, you know, it, it works out well. Um, take the time to learn a greeting in their language. That's always nice. Um, post visual schedules, uh, signs for bathroom, snack, drink. Often what I do when I have new students um, in the lower elementary, I will just put visuals on a ring or, you know, recess, line up, sick, happy, water fountain, toilet, so that if they don't have the language or they're still quite shy, they can just point to the, the correct visual on the ring to the teacher and the teacher will understand. Um, and, uh, you know, EAL students really do benefit from cooperative, 
groups and those learning opportunities and that exposure to the language of their peers. And oftentimes, uh, you know, the, their peers are the ones that are going to be teaching them more language than you or I ever could. Now, we have a little saying among EAL teachers that if you teach everyone like they're language learners, everyone will benefit. So visuals, using clear language, speaking at an appropriate pace, not too fast, avoiding idioms. Uh, be very aware of your body language and your gestures and your facial expressions. And I say this because when you don't understand the language being spoken around you, you quickly become in tune with facial expressions and reading body language. And sometimes teachers can become um, maybe a little bit overwhelmed or frustrated and not necessarily with the student, but with their struggles to get across the message. Um, and we're trying different ways to reword or recommunicate. And, you know, sometimes if we kind of sigh or roll our eyes or whatever we, we do, I mean, we have to remember we are human um, and sometimes people do this, but students might not understand why your, why your face or why your gestures are sort of expressing those emotions and they will take it personally. So always be very mindful of, you know, smiling and laughing and just having um, a kind, patient demeanor. Um, wait time. So that's when you ask a question or you're, you know, interacting with a student, um, just to give them an appropriate amount of time. And you can tell, you can see their face, you can see it in their eyes that they are trying their very best to produce something. So give them a few seconds. Um, and give them the opportunity to, you know, come up with their answer in their first language and then try and, and put it over into English. Um, another very important thing to do is to show examples of final projects or what you are wanting the final product to look like. If you have ever taken a course and uh, sometimes the teacher will say, or a professor or whoever, the leader, um, We'll say, oh, it's up to you how you want to present the work or, you know, sometimes the, the details are a little vague. We're still as adults, as teaching adults, we're still left like, oh, what do we do? What are other people doing? You know, and so these are things that I personally benefit from is seeing some some finished products and sort of as inspiration. So these are all important things to do. And. I will speak more about synonymous tags and repetition um, coming up. All right, so here's a few examples. Now, this picture here um, with the little black speech bubbles with the trees, this is actually uh, taken from Grosvenor Wentworth. I've had permission from their EAL teacher to share this. They have an I wonder wall out in their hallways. So. It's fantastic if within your school you do have an entrance that shows how culturally and linguistically diverse a school is. But Grosvenor Wentworth has gone a step uh, above and beyond that. And they've come up with an interactive wall. And I think it's every month or so they'll change the question and they'll have, I wonder, um, and they'll have different questions, but they put them in different languages and then the students walk by it and they say oh my gosh look that's my language or this is what this says or can you read it to me in Polish I'll read it to you in Korean and and it's just you know it's really neat for those students to see their language um, being shared and being valued and even sometimes students they might arrive in Canada before they started to read and write in their home language. Um, like for example, I think in Hungary, they don't start learning to read and write until they're seven. So if they move here when they're seven or six or seven, 
they don't necessarily know how to read and write in their language, but they can recognize it. And so when they have something, when they see themselves and their, their culture and their language being reflected in the schools, they just feel very valued and respected. And it just creates a, a better rapport, a better relationship, a better vibe for, for that community. Uh, the second picture is a list of words. So this was actually uh, something that happened in one of the classes I support. This was a little fella in grade four from Mexico. And so every time a word would come up that a student would say, well, what's that in Spanish? Or he would say, what's that in English? They had large chart paper on an easel in the uh, sort of to the front left of the board. And the students would just keep uh, a running list on large chart paper of the words. And, uh, you know, they all wanted to help him and he wanted to teach them words. And so it was it was really nice to see. Uh, the other the third picture here, the better word wall. Um, this is kind of along the lines of synonymous tag. So it's basically using synonyms, but providing a richer word. So I had created this poster um, with little pockets for basic words. So the point of this was within their writing, sometimes students get hung up on using the same sort of boring word like said, walked, ran, you know, they're nice, good. And so we created this so we've got the korean words on the front and then within the pockets are all the synonyms for all of these words and so they can see it in reading they can hear it and then they can incorporate these um, richer words in their writing so this was a grade six class i had done this for um, and then the final one is just a little quick snapshot of a uh, letter sound assessment and instead of just doing initial sound, I did get them to phonetically spell the words out. So there were two students in a grade one class, and one student spoke uh, Turkish, and the other student spoke Spanish. So the, the younger brother of the one that created the word list in grade four. Anyhow, we would um, go through the vocabulary, these little images, and we would say the word in English and see if they knew the word in English. And then the little one from Turkey would say the word in Turkish. And then the little fella from Mexico would say it in Spanish. And we would compare what the same sounds and the different ones. And then they would spell it out phonetically. And so we could see here that elephant is roughly the same in uh, English and Spanish. But we see um, in Turkish, it's actually feel. And so she wrote eel, elephant. So we did it in English, Turkish, and Spanish. So the Spanish child just did the word in Spanish, and the Turkish child just did that. So if we look at uh, wheel, wheel in Turkish is tekak, and in Spanish it's yanta. And so um, really making those connections with our letter sounds to words that they know that are familiar to them really uh, helps those early literacy stages in their reading and their writing. For older grades, and I'm not sure sort of what, what grades I have here, uh, what grades you teach, um, but there are growing number of dual language resources out, especially for the high school level. And so we've got some classics, we've got some Shakespeare poems that are available now uh, at the HRCE library. If you are, if you are interested, I can, um, actually Peru might know uh, some of these, um, where you can purchase some of these. So if you wanna go back and talk to your school about getting any of these, we can set you up with where to purchase them. Uh, so just because a student isn't reading Animal Farm in English, he or she might be reading it in 
Korean or Chinese, and chances are that book is dual language, so they can read it in their language and English. Because at the end of the day, those curriculum outcomes are typically, um, you know, it's about understanding what they're reading. And at the very, very beginning, it's important that they are reading and it's important that they can do some of the curriculum. Would we recommend this for someone who's been here for three and four and five years? No. But within the first year, absolutely, this is something that should be done. Um, I had a student come in grade six from Korea. Very, very smart, smart fella. And the classroom teacher was doing holes. And there is no way after living here for six weeks that he could possibly read holes. And so uh, I worked with the classroom teacher and I went to the public library and got a Korean book. And uh, he read that it was a chapter book, and it, I said, "Okay, so what are the outcomes for this novel study?" And it was, you know, identifying character traits and did the character change from the beginning of the story to the end of the story? What is the conflict? Um, you know, the the plot diagram and all of that, or the elements of a short or a, elements of a story, I guess. And and so that child, that student was able to do all of those outcomes, but for a book in their language. And in two and a half years, he was on and off EAL caseload, meeting and exceeding uh, English outcomes in English. So uh, this, the second picture here is a grade ten student, um, Russian Hebrew. He moved from Israel. And part of the grade 10 curriculum is to analyze a song. And so that can be very tricky to do if English is not your first language. It's tricky enough sometimes uh, to do it in English. So he, I worked with a classroom teacher and yep, do the choose a, choose a Russian song or a Hebrew song, sorry. Um, and write the lyrics and it's just about making connections why did you choose this song? How do you connect to this song? Um, and then they, we did it, in, and this was with support of myself, um, but again, met the outcome. He analyzed a song, was able to make connections to it and make sense of it, um, and uh, you know, had felt, just felt successful that he was producing work like the rest of the class was, and there was English on the back of them. So this one, you could do a language or a cultural club. Now, I had started this a number of years ago, but then there was work to rule. And so this kind of, I had done it for about two years and then it kind of fell flat and I wasn't allowed. Um, but creating a sort of task force, and, and if this is something that you are interested in and uh, you do do, you there's different, you know, levels to it. You know what I mean? It could be as big or as small as you wanted it to be, but it's just like, it's just creating a sort of task force of students that you have within your school that can be a resource to connect with, to support the newly arrived students. So, you know, I went around and surveyed all the students in uh, grades five and six and to see what languages and if they were interested in being sort of like a student ambassador or something, and if they would be willing to help out um, new students, whether it be in their grade or younger grades. Sometimes students have a hard time when they're brand new, they're overwhelmed, they're emotional, they're homesick, they're frustrated, they're anxious, all of these things. And sometimes they cry or they're, you know, um, they're disengaged. And so when, you know, we've tried to connect and communicate with them, sometimes it's nice to have someone that they, that we can call on that can come down to that classroom and act as a translator. Uh, and again, you could have it so that you just have a sort of a running list of students who are bilingual, multilingual, and are willing to volunteer their time and their uh, and their language skills, 
Or you could take it a step further where it's an actual group and they create signs or you know, for around the building or the entrances or the halls, or they might want to create some artwork. Maybe they want to do some, maybe they want to be involved in school assemblies. So it could be as simple as having a group of students who you can reach out to to act as translators. Um, or it could be, you know, you could take it to the next level where they're actually meeting and producing things for the school or involved in assemblies and, and what have you. All right, so I think coming up, I just have a few visuals to talk through. Um, here, I just wanna show you sort of the impact of visuals. And so this was a grade one class and they had a little rhyming poem here for the word family, O-A-T, oat and no visuals um and i said to the teacher would you be okay if i added some visuals for it she said oh my god would you mind my drawing is atrocious and i don't have time da, da, da. totally get it um but to students who are new to students who are you know do have um who don't have literacy in their first language to have a visual and to be able to connect the written word with the spoken word with a visual, all fantastic strategies to build on their, their oral language and their vocabulary and literacy development. So very, very important. So when you're reciting this poem or you're doing a choral reading of the poem, you can be pointing to the pictures, you could point to your own throat, whatever but that child in that room or children that you know are learning English they have exposure to this and they have an idea of what's happening this was a grade three class uh, starting fairy tales and so they worked on this list of you know parts of a fairy tale and so to someone who's you know learning English again they look at this huge list of words and it's quite daunting and they don't really know what to do with it. They might, they wouldn't know if this was science, social studies or English. So when you add some visuals, again, it gives them the gist of, ah, okay. So maybe you just translate the word fairy tale and then this paired with visuals and every Every country that I've ever worked with, every student from any country, they all have some sort of fairy tale and depending on where they came from are quite familiar with North American fairy tales. Okay, so going back to synonymous tags, and I know I have already spoken about this little poster, but um, just in our speaking and in our teaching instructions, so when you are actually delivering a lesson and it is, you know, teacher talking time. Um, we always recommend using synonymous tags. So this is sort of pairing an academic word with the simpler version. And I had one student uh, from Portugal, she was in high school and she said, uh, yeah, give me, she used to call it the cheap word and the expensive word. So she would say, well, what does that mean? And she would no, miss, give me the cheap word, give me the cheap word. And so that would be uh, the the simpler version. So let's say, for example, you know, you're doing the digestive system and you say, what is the role of the digestive system? Well, what, and you know what, chances are you might have students who are native English speakers who might not know R-O-L-E. They might think role as in roll over, role as in bread that you eat. And so when you speak like, what is the role or what is the job of the digestive system. That would be using a synonymous tag. So using job, which would be your cheap or easy word, with role, which would be your more expensive or academic word. Um, a student comes in, they've bumped their head or hurt their knee. Ouch, you've injured yourself. I see you've hurt yourself. And so when you speak like this, you're providing really all students uh, with richer, um, richer vocabulary and more academic vocabulary. Um, 
And as we know, uh, a lot of students really, you know, when they go home, they might not have the exposure to this kind of language. So regardless of what language they do speak, whether it be English or a language from another country, um, this is just another strategy that, um, you know, is really beneficial to students. The other thing is cognates. So those are words that sound the same in English as they do in their language. So uh, another great skill. All right, and again, just, you know, reiterating the importance of using first language. So this is another example similar to the visual I've already posted um, in a previous slide here, but this little one was in grade two from Croatia and doing the same thing, learning English letters and English sounds and comparing them to an English word, comparing them to um, what they know. So I think like pig is zvinja, and so we spelt it out. Uh, and then just the other one is um, the teacher, they were doing some vocabulary and these were some of the important words that the classroom teacher wanted the student to know. So we did some visuals and they had to match the English word with the um, their Arabic word to the visual. So again, bringing what they know into the content and into that vocabulary. So, you know, as we have newly arrived students and beginner language learners, um, you know, allow the use of, of home language and translation. There is a time and a place and sometimes students will, uh, they go through a phase where this is their crutch and they need it. And to sometimes uh, they get, um, they maybe take advantage of it. And so, and they might start to uh, rely on it a bit too heavily. So we do have to be mindful of that. Uh, but I mean, we've got students who have been here, they might not even still be on EAL caseload. Um, they might be bilingual or, you know, close to it. And there will be words that arise just like, you know, you and I, um, that they don't know. And so, you know, never say, oh, you don't need a translator anymore. You've been here long enough is really not appropriate. So um, there are times and place and you'll you'll know you'll know when they're taking advantage of it and when it's something that, you know, they they really do need. So just making sure that they have access to it. Uh, I spoke about the novel study example. So making use of their first language. Um, and also, I've already mentioned this as well, about a lot of popular stories and novels are currently available at public libraries. And if you do work within a different uh, region, uh, Center for Education, um, there might be an arrangement between your county libraries and the Halifax one. So that may be worth something uh, looking into because they might be able to do a delivery. And again, uh, Peru and I can connect you with um, where some of those resources are purchased. So in summary, valuing their home language and the experiences and their prior knowledge that they bring with them is an important part. Um, honoring and allowing use of home language and making connections between their backgrounds and new skills learned. Uh, and just making sure that they're doing the same as English counterparts. So, um, you know, we've done, you know, you give them vocabulary if they're doing structures um, or, um, oh my gosh, I'm at a loss for words, simple machines. And, you know, you can do lever and pulley and wedge, all of these things. So if you have English word, uh, their, their word in their language and a visual, they have something to refer to. Um, and so even if they're doing a piece of writing, like a persuasive paragraph, let's say, or a persuasive essay, maybe they don't have the language skills yet, but you can teach the word persuade, convince, make, make someone agree with you. And they can, they often will come up with their own idea of what they want to convince someone of, uh, and the reasons why. So it might, it could be anywhere from 
an idea with three listed reasons to a paragraph with or something maybe just the reason the examples with why and then it, we could turn that into a paragraph and then maybe depending on how long they've been here that can become you know your standard five paragraph essay so there's different levels to everything so um and you know really try and i know it's a two-way street absolutely and but you know get that eal teacher in your back pocket because they're a wealth of knowledge and um they can help you with a lot of these things if you're new to eal and as i've mentioned earlier none of these strategies really are you know um super surprising and there are things that you're probably doing that you didn't even realize you were doing or you're doing them with another student and you didn't realize oh my gosh this you know yeah 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 eal students would definitely benefit from this so um it's just really about honoring their home language and allowing them to use it and to refer to it and making connections to what they've already learned and how that can help them with with newly with new material that has to be learned.